it's from Romans 1, verse 16. And the topic is, the righteous shall live by faith. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation and to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and also to the Greek. For, it, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. The guilt of the Gentile world. Okay. Verse 18. For God's wrath is revealed from the heaven against all good godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown to them for he is invisible for his invisible attributes that is his internal power and divine nature. He has been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For thought for for though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worth, worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal of the immortal of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men, birds, four four footed animals and reptiles. Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to s God delivered them over in their desired in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Um, if we have not met, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor. I have the privilege of opening up the Word of God with you this morning, which I'm really excited about. It's a sermon that I enjoyed prepping, and it's a sermon that I'm looking forward to preaching. We are in week two of our new series called Gospel Fluency. Last week we said Gospel Fluency is all about our ability as Christians to apply the gospel to every area of our lives. We said last week, when you are fluent in the gospel, you tend to know how the gospel transforms your life and what it asks of you as a follower of Jesus without giving it much thought. It's like speaking a language fluently. I also said this last week, but let me say it again. We are trusting that God will do something special in the life of our church through this series. We had a bumpy start to the year as a church community, and we are praying that God will revive us, that He will revitalize us, and that we will truly experience life and life in abundance, the kind of love, uh, life that He gives us. I want to start off this morning with some really good news. I've got some good news for you. There is a massive gospel for massive sinners. It's good news. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. That is good news. By faith in Jesus, God makes unrighteous people righteous. And that is good news. How does he do that? Well, by what Martin Luther called the great exchange. Jesus in our place. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. It's not my own words, it comes from the Bible and it is the truth. The Apostle Paul makes this grand claim in the beginning of our teaching text 
and I want to show it to you. Uh, in verse 16, he says, The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Look at the emphasis. To everyone who believes, and in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. And the righteous will live by faith. It's the beginning of a massively long book, but Paul states his argument and his theme, and now we will explain exactly what he means. So the grand theme of the book of Romans, from which we read this morning, is there is a righteousness that is revealed in Jesus, and that's great news. Why? Because it shows that God always does what is right and just, and that He is faithful to His promises. Now, just to be sure that you and I who read the Scripture understand the gravity and the weight and the significance and the importance of this claim, Paul doesn't share how to get salvation just yet. He says salvation is there, but he doesn't say how you get it. He'll only get there in chapter 3. Rather, Paul starts and then argues why we need salvation. And why this good news truly is good news. So let me give you a picture. This is taken from the Bible Project, from the um, Scripture Overview. So the, uh, chapters 1 to 4 in the book of Romans, Paul says the gospel reveals God's righteousness. He makes the grand claim in the beginning that I just spoke about. And in chapter 3 you see there it says, but... Good news! Why? Because Jesus became what we are so that we can become what He is. We are justified by faith in Christ and we are declared righteous. That's where He's heading. That's great news. But before He gets there, He says, you are guilty. And even though you might not think you are guilty because you're one of God's people, you're an Israelite, you're a Jew, you are even more guilty. That's the point that Paul is making. Why? Because if you know what's wrong and you know there's a solution, then the solution truly is good news. And you and I need to hear this today because familiarity breeds unfamiliarity. We get so used to the good news. We get so used to the forgiveness of sins. We get so used to the proclamation of the gospel that we sometimes forget how awesome it is. Who of you stood in front of the mirror this morning and took your toothbrush and went, okay, I really have to think about this now. Circular movements, get it nice and foaming, cover all angles, outside and inside, uh, and the tongue, and at the back. You don't think about it, because you do it, I hope, at least once a day, but actually twice a day, every day. Think about your commute on your way to work. Francois said that he spends this amount of time on the N1. It becomes so familiar to you, that you sometimes don't even remember what the commute looks like. It's the same with family. Sometimes we get so familiar with the fact that we're married and that we have kids that we forget that it's a really big gift and that we should steward it. When we hear the gospel, we need to know and believe why we need the gospel. Because then it will be good news. And what Paul does today in this portion of Scripture is he's like a doctor telling you why you need help. Right? So a medical practitioner looks at you, tells you there's something wrong, that's really bad news. And then a medical practitioner tells you that we can do something about it, and that's really good news. And that's exactly what Paul is busy with in this part of his argument. Now, quick note. Paul is not gentle and comforting in this passage. He is hammering the pride and the arrogance of humanity. Paul is hammering the fact that we think that we are good. And that we think we don't need anyone or anything. So I want to warn you that this is an uncomfortable text. And sometimes people can hear it with offense. Because our first pride, prideful and arrogant response to this text is, well, who do you think you are? And when we say those words, it comes from uh, who we think we are. And that is prideful and arrogant. 
And that's what Paul is drilling into deeply. So I want to ask you, exactly like Janet prayed for us now, posture your heart today. Do not respond prideful and arrogant, but rather submit under the word because we need this word today. Why do we need the gospel? Let me answer that question. And this is our four points. Because we know there is a God. Verses 18 to 20. We move towards idolatry. Three M's, you'll see it. Idolatry is madness. And idolatry leaves us miserable. And that is why we need the gospel. Let's go. First one, we know there is a God. I'll have the scripture up with the necessary emphasis. The word for in verse 18 connects us to the previous verses. And in the previous verses, Paul just spoke about the gospel. Okay? And he uses this word for, 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 for throughout this whole section to create one unit and one argument. Now there's your first answer. Why do we need the gospel? We need the gospel because of God's wrath. That's why we need it. What's the reason for God's wrath? Well, humanity knows that He exists, yet they turn to idolatry. That's the reason for God's wrath. Now, I do know that the words God's wrath is loaded. So let's spend some time here to just understand what it is and where it comes from. Fam, it's so important that we understand this. I'm going to put my notes on the screen for you so that you can actually read it with me. And these notes come from a blog post that was written by someone who I follow in the United States called Matt Tebby. And he makes the reason for God's wrath very, very clear. Read it with me. God's wrath is God's love opposing that which harms God's good creation. God is love. God is not wrath. Love is an ontological essence. That means it is something that is in your nature. Wrath is a response from that essence. The object of God's wrath is that which infects and corrupts creation. Not creation itself. God made creation to be good. But something corrupts and infects it. And that is the object of God's wrath. Wrath as understood as God's love opposing that which harms and corrupts, seeks to protect, redeem, and liberate. God's wrath is not a temper tantrum. God's wrath is not losing it. God's wrath is because He wants to protect, because He wants to redeem, because He wants to liberate. Think of the feeling you have when a child gets hurt. That thing that wells up inside of you is wrath. Because you want to protect, you want to save, you want to liberate. Why? Because I know as a human being, this child being hurt is not good. Think of any news story where kids get hurt or where adults are exposed to be hurting kids. The wrath of the public comes down on those people. Now, Can you imagine what the wrath of God must be like if you have the ability to feel that wrath? God isn't insecure. God's renown isn't fragile. So, God's wrath isn't just or primarily for God's sake. God doesn't need something that only wrath can deliver. Wrath isn't a selfish response. It is a loving response. Last one. Rather, God is love. And so, God cannot be or do otherwise. Love is fierce and strong when it encounters opposition or resistance that harms that which or those whom are beloved. Do you guys get that? 
It's because God loves us that He responds with wrath if we get hurt. It's because God loves other human beings and responds with wrath to you if you hurt someone. Because He loves us. Not because He throws a tantrum. Not because He's violent. Not because He's angry. And we need to sit with this. We cannot treat the character traits of God like a buffet. Ooh, I'll have a lot of the love and the grace, not so much the wrath and the discipline. It's not a buffet. He is who He is. And God's wrath is an essential part of His character. Now, look at the emphasis in this passage. It's revealed against all What no, what's known about God is evident because God has shown it to them. And uh, 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 His invisible attributes have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. And therefore, people are without excuse. That's really, really important. Why? Because you are without excuse. And I am without excuse. Quick sidebar here. Yeah. This is why the church of Jesus Christ needs to evangelize. Because all people can see God. All people can know God. If you open up your eyes and you look further than your nose, you are supposed to see something about God. Breath in our lungs, the sunrise, nature, whatever it is. Paul says, you know. It's evident among you. But just knowing God doesn't mean that you'll be saved. That's why we need to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So that people can be in right relationship with God. When we evangelize people, we should say to them, the God you serve is not the God who made all of this. But you want to serve a God because you can see everything that He's made. But let me tell you about the God who made all of this. And how He revealed Himself to us. Why do we need God's righteousness? Well, we don't want His wrath now, do we? All that is under heaven. Do you guys see in verse 18 where his wrath comes from? It's revealed from heaven. All that is under heaven and not in Christ is under God's wrath. That's the truth. Paul's logic throughout Romans is really easy. Let me show it to you. God possesses perfect righteousness. Yes. God demands perfect righteousness. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do not possess perfect righteousness. That's a problem. Therefore, we need someone else's righteousness. That's Paul's argument in the book of Romans. Now, question. Might God provide righteousness for us? The answer, my dear friends, is yes. Why? Because Jesus is our atoning sacrifice and by faith in Him we will live. That's verse 17. We receive the righteousness of Jesus when we believe. And righteousness means you are free from guilt or sin. It's covered. It's paid. You are good to go. Here's the truth. God deals with everyone with either deserved judgment or undeserved grace. That's the only way that God deals with humanity. Now the question is, how can you be dealt with by grace? Well, the answer is, look to Jesus. Flee the wrath of God and take refuge in Jesus. We have a great need for a Savior. And listen to this. We have a great Savior for our need. He's revealed to us. And you and I, as human beings, either believer or not, we should tremble at God's holiness. And then as believers, we should be thankful that there is refuge in Christ. Through faith, not through anything else. This was the first of four points. I know that I took quite long on this one, but it does make the case why we need the gospel already now, doesn't it? Three more. Quick note before we head into these three. Exchanges is the main theme here. And what Paul says is, you make some really bad trades. Why? Because you exchange this for that. 
and I'll show it to you. Second point, why do we need the gospel? Because we move towards idolatry. Look at verse 21. They knew God. They did not glorify Him or show gratitude. Instead, there's the first exchange, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Who is your God? Because we all worship. So who or what do you worship? If an atheist ever tells you that they don't worship anything, then you can reply with, that means that you worship yourself. Because you're claiming autonomy over your life, and you are too prideful and arrogant to submit under anything or anyone because you know everything. That's what an atheist essentially is. So even if you are an atheist and you say that there is no God, you still worship yourself. All of us worships something. And now what Paul says is that all sins that characterize humanity have its roots in the soil of idolatry. Why? Because idolatry leads to immorality. You will behave like the God you worship. So our sin problems are worship problems. Think of the sin that's currently in your own life, and then you think of the idol that sits underneath it, and I can promise you, you'll get to arrogance and pride, because you are worshiping yourself, and therefore you are sinning, or worshiping something else that the God you worship permits. Now just look at Paul's strong words, a worthless mind and a senseless heart. Anyone? Who wants one? Yeah, like my life goal is I want a worthless mind and a senseless heart. No one wants that. Because our mind is given to us to comprehend God's grand revelation. And our hearts are given to us as the center of our being. That gives us the ability to love and to have grace and to sacrifice and to pursue God and to pursue His kingdom and to be good the way He made us. We tend to move towards idolatry because we know that there is a God, but we worship something else. We do not glorify Him and we don't give Him gratitude. And then what happens is our very being gets worthless and it gets darkened. Why? Because you choose not to give God glory. And you choose not to show gratitude. Guys, do you realize what a big difference it makes if you decide to be grateful for what God has given you? This Wednesday at City Group, I was busy prepping my sermon on Tuesday. And this Wednesday at City Group, I was like, guys, let's just have a thank fest. Let's go around the table. Laid with chicken wings, by the way, which was really, really good. But let's go around the table and say thank you. What are we thankful for? It took us 90 minutes, almost, to get around the table. Because once we started thinking about it, and once we started sharing about it, we realized how good God is to us, and what He has given us. And you know what happens then? Then you give Him glory. And then if you give Him glory, it stirs gratefulness again. And when it stirs gratefulness, and you give Him glory, and you give Him glory, and it stirs gratefulness, then your heart will not become darkened. Your mind will not become worthless. But that's what happens if you worship an idol. Why do we need the gospel? Third point. Because idolatry is madness. Look at what Paul says in verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And there's another exchange. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, right? The one that is outside time of space, time and space. The one that is transcendent above all things. The one that is always present and ever knowing and all powerful. You traded that for something that is mortal. Man, birds, four-footed animals and reptiles. G.K. Chesterton says, 
when man ceases to worship God, he does not worship nothing, but worships everything. Now you might say, I don't have the temptation to bow before statues or to worship animals. But scripture teaches us that idolatry isn't merely about carved images. It's about our hearts. One of the great church reformers, John Calvin, said, Our hearts are idol factories. And our hearts have the tendency of worshipping things and different things at different times. Just think about this. Whatever you give your best time to, whatever you give your best attention to, whatever you give your best resources to, is that which you worship. So what is it? Because if it's not God, it's an idol. An idol, sit with this, is anything you look to to give you what only God can give. That is an idol. And here's the bad news about idolatry, is it promises so much, but it delivers so little. It's time to tear down some idols in this place. Let's talk about money. Everything in the, on this earth that you can buy with your money is perishable. It will not last forever. And it will not give you what you most crave. It will not fulfill you. It will not satisfy you. At the most, it will give you momentary pleasure. But it will never, ever give you lasting joy. There's a reason why the Bible speaks three times more about money than it talks about prayer. Because money corrupts you. Prayer doesn't. But once money corrupts you, you start serving it. Once you start serving it, you become greedy. Once you become greedy, you become stingy. Once you become stingy, you get more greedy, and then you want more, hoping that it will deliver and give you what you most want. And I'm telling you now, it will not. This world, in this free economy, worships money. And we cannot allow that idol to be an idol in our lives or in our church. Only you know if you serve money or not. I'm telling you, serve it all you want. It'll never fulfill you. And you will not take a single thing with you into our everlasting life. And you might say, it's for my family. They'll also enjoy it only for a bit and then they'll also die. Unless Jesus comes back, obviously, which will be phenomenal. I mean, I do welcome that. It'll be great if you can just come and make everything new now. It will not satisfy you. But the whole world and all of the messages that we get every single day tells you that money will solve all your problems. It will not. Let's talk about sex. Why should we talk about sex? Because sex is everywhere. And the fact that sex is everywhere makes me believe that the world we live in has an unsatisfiable need for sex. And that's why it's available everywhere. Sex is God's gift to mankind. For the proper expression of our natural instincts with which He has endowed us. That's what the form for marriage says. Sex isn't meant to be worshipped because it won't satisfy you. If you lust after it enough to take it or use it outside God's bounds for it, you are worshipping it. Because I need it so bad that I either engage in illegitimate relationships or sexual interactions, or I look at pornography and consume it and use it. I can't wait. I need it now. You are worshipping it if that is your posture. And sex isn't meant to be worshipped. But because you worship it, it leaves you empty, it leaves you guilty, it leaves you shameful, it leaves you fearful. And that's not what you wanted before you did it now, is it? 
And not only that, it kills your marriage, it kills your family, it kills your own sexuality. It creates big problems for everyone. But this world we live in worships sex. It will not satisfy you. The world we worship in, ach, the world we live in worships relationships. Some of us idolize our marriage and our kids. Because you put them first and God second. That is an idol. God first, everything else distant second. Am I called to steward my marriage? Of course I am. Am I called to love my wife well? Of course I am. Am I called to be an awesome dad to my kids? Of course I am. But that cannot be the first thing that I think about when I wake up in the morning. I cannot. For if I give them my best attention, then I'm worshipping them. And then when we run into conflict, I am unsatisfied and frustrated and ungrateful because I was depending on this thing to be everything for me. It cannot be. But it's so easy to do so. Last one. Comfort. Middle class people and up in South Africa is so comfortable that we cannot be bothered with the things of the kingdom. And that is an idol. I want my comfort. I want stuff that makes me feel well and loved and awesome. And the more I can get of it, the more I'll get of it. And therefore, I really can't be bothered about anything else than myself. Our comfort keeps us paralyzed. It takes up your time and your money and your attention and it tells you that you want it. And then when you get it, what's the next thing you do? Then you just want the next one and the next one and the next one. And do you know what the shocking thing about this reality is? Is that the enemy has you exactly where he wants you. Fast asleep. With all your attention diverted to your own comforts. People going to hell, not an issue. People suffering, not an issue. The injustice of this world, not an issue. I can't even think about it because all I want is this new model of this new car or this new couch or this new ultra HD TV or this new 200 meg fiber line or whatever it is. The world we live in keeps you asleep and paralyzed by offering you comfort. Do you know what the Apostle Paul says about that? He says it's madness. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's foolish to worship an idol. If you're fluent in the gospel, that means that you are fluent in talking about idolatry. And that you can articulate why you need the gospel and also be able to explain why the gospel is good news to you. Fam, we need to be able to say in any setting, guys, I'm really struggling with greed at the moment. Like, all I think about is money. And I just want more. And I keep on panicking about what I have. And I keep on scrolling the socials and seeing everyone else's awesome life. And I think, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Pray for me. Because that is me worshipping something else and not God. Now I know that the good news is that if I repent and turn, that God will receive me. And that God will sanctify this part of me. We need to have that fluency when it comes to the gospel. I don't think we do, but we should. Let's recap. Why do we need the gospel? Three things. We know there's a God. We move towards idolatry. And idolatry is madness. Let me... Land us with this one. Idolatry leaves us miserable. Therefore, says Paul in verse 24, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts. And then he singles out sexual impurity. But I already covered that. That word means God gave them up. That's the, the best, flattest translation of that Greek word. Therefore, God gave them up. Do you know what that means? That means that God essentially says that if you don't want me, I'll give you what you want. Because He's a loving God. 
He's not an oppressing, autocratic, dictator kind of God. If you don't want me, I'll give you what you want. C.S. Lewis says there's two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. That's the reality of this passage. Now look at the result in verse 24. Do you know what you get when you worship an idol? Your body becomes degraded. That's the result. Now I don't know about you, but none of us wake up in the morning and going, Oh, I cannot wait to degrade my body today. I cannot wait to ruin what God has created. Paul says that's what happens. And you get ruined, even though you were created for something else, because you didn't want God. And God said, well, okay, if you don't want me, then I'll give you what you want. And then Paul takes us home in the last part of verse 25, and he shows us what we are giving up by making this exchange. We are giving up, check, worshipping and serving the Creator who is praised and blessed forever. But they exchanged that truth. And they exchanged that truth for a lie. But here's the truth. The truth is that you are giving up the very thing that you were created for. And then you wonder why you are miserable. Just sit with that. We worship idols, we trust something else to give us what only God can give us, and then we are miserable, and then we wonder why. Well, Paul says it's because you're not doing what you were created to do. It's really easy. You were created to worship the Creator, and that will satisfy you, and He is the one that is blessed forever. Last thing that I want to say about idolatry, conversion is exchanging your idols for God. Idolatry is exchanging God for your idols. Do you guys see it? Look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. He writes to the Thessalonians and he said, For they themselves report what kind of reception we had from you. He was saying, I'm so thankful for you guys. You guys are so awesome. And then look what they say. He says, this is the testimony I heard about you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming, and there's the word again, wrath. That's what conversion is. Conversion is leaving idols and turning to God. Do you guys see why we need the gospel? Because we have turned. And we need to turn back. And the good news is, we can. Because Jesus covered it all. If you look to Jesus to save you from idolatry and immorality, He will have you. He'll take you. He'll save you. He'll bring you from darkness into light. And He'll shape His image inside of you through the presence of His Holy Spirit. That is phenomenal news. God demands righteousness from us. And God has provided righteousness for us in Jesus. And the truth is, and the good news is, that you can be united to Him through repentance and faith. I started with this, let me end with this. I've got, I've got good news for you. There's a massive gospel for massive sinners. There's more mercy in Christ than sin in us. And by faith in Jesus, God makes unrighteous people righteous. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. It might be that you are convicted of idols in your life this morning. Do not flee from the conviction. Own it. Acknowledge it. And turn from it. Do not measure yourself against any other human being. The one who we measure ourselves against is Christ, who was perfect. 
It's time to tear down idols that is keeping us from the kingdom of God. You might feel a really, really hard prompting to repentance. Do it. Turn. Turn away from something to something that is better and more life-giving. Turn from idols to God. Do not miss this moment. You might be convicted this morning through this word that you do not live a life of gratitude. Do not run from the conviction. Repent and start being grateful. And give God the glory. And worship Him, the immortal, perfect, transcendent one. Do not exchange Him for mortal things that are from this earth. I don't know where you are at this morning. But I do just want to hold space for us to deal with what it is that the Spirit is doing inside of us. Lord Jesus, we confess this morning that we are truly without excuse. And that we tend to move towards idolatry. And we confess this morning that that idolatry is foolish. It is madness. And it leaves us miserable. And then, Lord Jesus, I think of you gazing at us, seeing us miserable and unfulfilled and ungrateful and still wanting us. Because you showed your love to us on the cross with open arms and you'll embrace us. Lord Jesus, that is great news. And I pray today that all of us sitting here now and all of us who might be listening to this sermon in the future, that the good news would be truly good news. Because we know how much we need this. We praise you for being our atoning sacrifice. We praise you for giving us life and life in abundance. We praise you as our Savior. We praise you as the one who became what we were so that we can become what you are. And that all of us can sit here today and be declared righteous. Father God, it gives me so much joy to think that you look down on our church and that you see each and every one of us through the lens of your Son. That there's no sin that we ought to pay for. There's nothing keeping us from you. But like a child runs to the arms of their father, we can run to you. Father God, may this be a reality to us this morning. May we become fluent in these things. May this church, in this time, serve you and you alone. I pray that in your name. Amen. Thank you.